you have questions, the Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, welcome once again to a Bible answer. We're so happy that you're watching the program today. This program is dedicated to answering your questions from the Word of God. My name is Mike McDaniel, and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville in Missouri. And this program is brought to you by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and 31 faithful congregations of the Church of Christ throughout this region. We have three gospel preachers serving as panelists. We're so grateful that they are here. They've done a wonderful job the last three weeks. We know they will today. And we'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. I'm B.J. Clark. I preach for the Highway 77 Church of Christ in Marion, Arkansas. And I also work with the Memphis School of Preaching. I'm Wade Webster, and I preach for the South Haven Church of Christ in South Haven, Mississippi. I'm Mike Hicks, and I preach for the Olive Branch Church of Christ in Olive Branch, Mississippi. Again, we're grateful to these brethren for being with us. We're grateful for the questions that you've sent in. Please keep sending in those good questions. Our first question to Brother B.J. Clark today. Brother Clark, what baptism is referred to in 1 Corinthians 12, 13? Many apply this to Holy Spirit baptism. Brother Clark. The reason why the question is interesting is because there are multiple baptisms mentioned on the pages of the New Testament. We read of John's baptism. We read of the baptism of suffering that Jesus would endure. We also read of the baptism of fire, which no one should want to experience. We read of a number of baptisms, and by the time we get to Ephesians 4, 5, Paul says there is one baptism. But which one? Some would suggest that Holy Spirit baptism is the one. And they would suggest, as Mike has noted already, that 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is a reference to Holy Spirit baptism. One thing we know for sure is this. The baptism mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is the baptism that puts one into the body of Christ. Now that's significant because we now ask, what is the body of Christ? And we answer from Scripture, He is the head of the body of the church. The Bible says the church, Ephesians 1, and 23, is His body. And Ephesians 5, 23 says He's the Savior of that body. So, the baptism that puts us into the body of Christ is the baptism that puts us into the church. Can we find a place in the New Testament where people were being baptized and being added to the church, the body? And the answer is yes. We see it in Acts chapter 2. The people said, what shall we do? And the inspired preacher did not tell them to bow their heads and say a little prayer with him. He said, rather, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. May I point out to you, he told them they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit after that. And so this shows us that it was not the same event as baptism. It was something that would follow it in their case. Now, I want you to stop and think about this with me. The Holy Spirit had already fallen in Acts chapter 2 upon the apostles to immerse them in His power and to enable them to speak in languages they did not ordinarily find themselves equipped to speak. When the people were baptized in Acts 2, about 3,000 were added. Added to what? Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church... What did we say earlier? The baptism of 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. But the body is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Those who were baptized in Acts 2 were added to the church, baptized into the body. And may I point out something to you also? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we. He puts himself in the category. What baptism did Saul of Tarsus experience? It was one where he had to get up. And may I point out to you, you didn't have to move your posture to receive Holy Spirit baptism. 
Holy Spirit baptism was a direct outpouring from above on to the recipients. It was never commanded of anyone. It was always a promise only to those who were Jew and Gentile. In the case of the apostles, the Jews received it representatively through the apostles. The Gentiles received it representatively through Cornelius to show that Gentiles were eligible for kingdom membership. You read about this in Acts chapter 10, but what you also read is this. When the apostle Peter saw the Holy Spirit fall upon the Gentiles, he immediately thought, can any man forbid water? that these should not be baptized, seeing they received the Holy Spirit as well as we. The Holy Spirit baptism wasn't sent to save them or to put them into the body, but to show that they could be baptized in water to enter the body of Christ. Peter as a Jew now knew that. That was a divine message from God. So they baptized those Gentiles and they were added to the body of Christ. The baptism that is described in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is one of water and of the Spirit, meaning this, the Holy Spirit's message is given like the eunuch received it in Acts chapter 8. And after hearing the message of the Holy Spirit through an inspired preacher, that eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he was baptized immediately. And in 1 Peter 3 and verse 20, there's a, a mention of water and how it saved those eight souls on that ark. And the Bible says, The like figure whereunto even baptism, yes, water baptism, does also now save us. That's the baptism, the one baptism of Ephesians 4, 5, because 526 mentions a washing of water by the Word, the Word given by the Holy Spirit. And that's the answer from the Scriptures, and we hope it's been helpful to you. Well, that was a great answer, and I appreciate that very much. Our next question is also related uh, to the previous one, this one to Brother Webster, is the baptism of fire a reference to Holy Spirit baptism? Matthew 3.11, Luke 3.17. Some say quench not the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5.9, means don't put out the fire. We'll give that to you, Brother Webster. The baptism of fire is mentioned in Matthew chapter 3 and verses 10 through 12. John the Baptist is preaching and as he is preaching there, he talks about the baptism of fire. We want to read his words and then talk about them. Beginning in verse 10, John says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat unto the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. There we read about this baptism of fire. In the context, it has reference to the punishment that's going to come to the wicked. It is the punishment that comes to the tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit. It is the punishment that comes to the chaff rather than to the wheat which is gathered into the barn to be saved. In the context, the baptism of fire has to do with the unquenchable fire, the eternal punishment that is going to come upon the wicked. Perhaps you have heard someone on an occasion ask for the baptism of fire. If you've ever heard anyone ask that, then you can be assured that they did not know what they were asking for. They did not understand that they were asking for eternal punishment. One day Christ is going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God and from the glory of His power. We do not want to be among those who experience that flaming fire. In Revelation chapter 20, in verses 14 and 15, we read of a lake of fire. We read of it again in Revelation 21 and verse 8. And there are those who one day will be baptized in that lake of fire. They will be immersed in that lake. You should want to be immersed in water for the remission of your sins, but you should never want to be immersed in fire and be punished for your sins. And in order to avoid doing that, we want to make sure that we have been baptized in water and that our sins have been taken away. 
The other passage that is referenced is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19, where the Bible says, quench not the spirit. I do not believe that there is a connection between these two passages, but I will comment on this passage as well. When we talk about quenching not the spirit, it may be easier to understand what's being talked about here by using another occasion where the word quench is used. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is talking about the Christian soldier. And he talks about the Christian soldier taking the shield of faith wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You carry this shield. This shield has been immersed in water. It is as wet as you can possibly make it. And so when these fiery darts come in contact with it, those fiery darts are put out. In like manner, there are those who quench the Spirit. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen was stoned for saying these words, and yet they remain true. Stephen convicted the hearts of those that were gathered there on that occasion, and he said that their fathers resisted the Holy Spirit and that they were doing the same. The Holy Spirit wants to operate in our lives. He wants, us to, he wants to lead us in the way of salvation, and yet our free will is involved in this. The Holy Spirit will not override our free will. The bride and the Spirit say, Come, let him that heareth say, Come, let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Man has a free will. Man chooses whether to accept the invitation that the Spirit offers or to reject that. And if he rejects it, then the Holy Spirit will not overpower him. The Holy Spirit will not put irresistible grace upon him, but rather the Holy Spirit will reluctantly turn away from him. And the invitation may be offered yet again, but yet again the man will have the opportunity to resist that. The long ago, Joshua said, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. And man still has that choice today. I hope this answers that question. Thank you, Brother Webster. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled, Speaking in Tongues. If you'd like this good tract, or if you'd like to take our correspondence course, we wish you would. Just request either one of these items by contacting us at Phillip Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillip Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may call our toll-free number, but if you do so and get the answer machine, please leave your full address information. That's 1-800-436-0463. Or, as many people like to do, you may email us. And that address is a Bible answer, all small letters, at earthlink.net. We also want to remind you to go to our website. That's abibleanswertv.com. A BibleAnswerTV.com, and there you can see our programs archived on our YouTube channel for viewing. Now back to our program today and our questions. Our next question to Brother Hickson. Brother Hickson, why did God choose Israel to be a special people unto himself? Brother Hickson. Well, that is a good question, and without being facetious, my response would be because he's God. You see, God in the long ago created a plan whereby men and women could be saved. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation in chapter 13 that the lamb that was slain was slain before the foundation of the world. And I think there is a reference there to the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. In the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible tells us in chapter 3 verse 15 that God interposed, intervened on behalf of fallen man and set forth what is typically called the promised seed. In order to bring that promised seed to fruition, God needed a channel, a nation, a family, a people, if you please, to bring that plan to pass or to fruition. And so in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we have the calling of Abraham. Abraham, of course, was of sterling character, not flawless, but a good man. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls him the friend of God. And God said to Abraham that in thee shall all nations, all families of the earth, be blessed. Now, why did God call Abraham? Well, again, because he's God, and God needed a people. He needed a nation through whom the Christ, the promised seed, could emerge. 
And so God chose Abraham. And it would be through his lineage that the Messiah, the Son of God, would make his entrance into the world. Now I believe that Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 finds its fulfillment in Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 and that being in Christ because the Apostle Paul talks, talks about those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus. And he said that those who are Christ are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Well, what promise? The promise that had been made nearly 2,000 years earlier to Abraham, that great patriarch of the past. Now, when you look at the Old Testament, you find that that seed line came through the loins of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then through Judah. Well, we talk about we talk about Jacob. You remember God said in the long ago, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Did God hate Esau? Well, of course not. God loved Jacob more. I think that's what the text is saying there. But God chose to channel the Christ, that seed, through Jacob. And so we talk about the seed line running through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and then the family of David. Over in 2 Samuel chapter 12, or rather chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, God promises to establish a kingdom. That kingdom would find its fulfillment in the church of Christ. And so really what we're talking about is the wisdom of Almighty God. And God decreed in the long ago to send the Christ, His only begotten Son, into the world to save those of us who belong to the human family. Today we are blessed through the blood of Jesus. And that blood was shed so that you and I might enjoy the hope of eternal life. When we're baptized into Christ, we become heirs according to the promise made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and we become sons of the living God. We become members of the household of God, that is, the family of God. And so when we ask this question, you know, why did God choose the nation of Israel? Why did He choose them to be His special people? Well, again, in short, He needed a people. He needed someone to bring this seed to fruition. Now, in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible tells us that the church, that is the kingdom of God, it is the Israel of God today. Is the kingdom here? Yes. Is the kingdom synonymous with the church? Yes. Have those who have been baptized into Christ, have they been added to the church? Yes. Are they a part of God's eternal plan that is to save, that is to save the human family in His beloved Son, Christ? Absolutely. And so, Mike, I hope that that answers that question because really and truly we're talking about the wisdom of Almighty God. And it is God that is the one who decreed to use Israel to be a channel of blessing to the world today. Thank you very much, Brother Hickson, for that good answer. This is an interesting question to Brother Clark. What are the pros and cons of short-term missions? Brother Clark. It's always important to uh, define our terms carefully. Uh, Short-term missions, what is meant by that? It may be that the person asking the question is contrasting that with uh, someone who takes up residence for a long-term mission effort. But short-term missions do have some positive things attached to them. Think about uh, the evangelist Philip who went out, left a, a great revival in Samaria in Acts chapter 8 where multitudes of men and women were being baptized and God sent him out to a solitary man in a wilderness place where he preached Jesus unto that man and baptized that Ethiopian into Christ and he went on his way rejoicing, the Ethiopian did, and Philip then went back to another location. I want you to stop and consider that that was a short-term mission, and yet it meant a lot to that one soul that was lost. And so a short-term gospel meeting effort or campaign effort uh, can be uh, a tremendous, tremendous thing because the seed is being sown. And wherever the seed of the kingdom, which is the Word of God, is being sown, is being distributed and dispensed and broadcast that's a very important thing not to be underestimated. The Apostle Paul's mission work was constantly on the move. He would be in one location and then he would say he wanted to go to another location and then move on and preach at another location. Uh, so there are evidences of that. Our students at the Memphis School of Preaching on more than one occasion go and conduct campaigns for a week and uh, some of the faculty members such as Brother McDaniel and others actually preach in those uh, gospel meeting efforts. Uh, there have been countless souls saved over the years in these short-term, uh, week-long events. 
Now, what's the con? The con might be to limit our evangelistic work to those short-term missions and make that the, the total focus of what we do throughout the year. Well, we have a one meeting a year, and that's when we really try hard to get folks to come and uh, attend the services. Souls are important in January, February, March, and April as much as they are in the fall when people might typically have their gospel meetings. And we need to be working on a year-round basis to evangelize, not just in one concentrated effort. Those concentrated efforts can be helpful, but they certainly need to be followed by consistent perpetual evangelism. And then one other thing comes to mind. Some of these short-term missions uh, that take place, especially on foreign soil, I believe, boast of great numbers. Uh, I remember reading about uh, someone that proclaimed they had had half a Pentecost in their mission work in a certain place where they'd spent two or three weeks and they'd baptized 1,500 people. There was no one left there to carry out the second part of the Great Commission, which is to take those that you've taught and baptized and to teach them to observe all things that God had commanded. If we don't follow our short-term missions and baptisms that result therefrom by training those who've been baptized to know all things God has said, then we've left out a vital part of the Great Commission, and so we must not allow that to be a danger. We need to do both of the things Jesus said. Go, teach, baptize, and then teach the ones you baptized all that I've said. And hopefully that will be helpful in this regard. Thank you, Brother Clark. To Brother Webster, the person says, How can I evangelize my friends and family members without offending them or pushing them away? Brother Webster. Well, I want to begin by commending the person who's asked this question and the fact that they're trying to teach another person the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, I encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, you will not always do it in the way that you want to do it. It will not always go the way that you want it to go. Some of the seed will not fall in good soil. It will not bring forth fruit ultimately. But you continue to sow the seed. We need to understand that Jesus was the master teacher that Jesus loved men as much as anyone could ever love another person. And yet men did not always receive what he had to say. We should not be surprised then as we follow him that men will not always receive what we have to say. But we want to make sure that we do our teaching, we do our instruction in the very best way that we can to avoid from unnecessarily uh, causing them to turn away from the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verses 24 through 26, Paul instructs the servant of the Lord not to strive, but to, be, but to be gentle, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. A number of words here call to mind what we need to have on our minds as we teach another person. We don't need to strive. We don't need to get in an argument about words. We need to sit down and open the Bible together if they have an argument, their argument should be with God and what God says, and let them argue with Him. They're going to lose that argument, but don't just get in an argument of words with them. But be gentle with them. Understand that at one time you were where they are now, and that you were searching for truth, and that it was hard for you to understand, and hard for you to see things at times as well. Consider as well that you should be apt to teach which means that you should do all that you can to prepare yourself for the study that you're engaged in. You need to better prepare yourself to be able to sit down and to teach another person the truth of the gospel. You also need to make sure that you're patient, uh, that you do not get in a hurry, realizing that they may have been in sin for some time and it will take them time to get out of sin. They may have been taught error for years and it will take them some time in order to get all of that error out of their minds and to be receptive to truth. You need to be meek with them. Meekness is not weakness. It is a quiet kind of courage. And so you need to be courageous. You need to be bold in teaching them, but you need to do so in a quiet way. You don't have to raise your voice. You don't have to get angry with them as you teach them. Try to teach them in the way that Jesus taught those that he taught out of sincere love for their souls, trying to help them to recover themselves from the error that they have now found themselves in. Speak the truth in love, 
Ephesians 4 and verse 15. Do so in meekness and in fear. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. Some will still get angry. Some will get angry merely because you're telling them the truth. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16. Tell them the truth and do it in love. I hope that that helps you and your teaching other people. I'm glad we got to that question. That's such a good question, and that was a good answer. We appreciated it and all the answers that have been given today in the last several weeks by these good panelists, gospel preachers all, on a Bible answer. The poet has said, If all the riches of this world were mine, and all the lovely gems that brightly shine, if I possessed a large estate and grand, and choicest fruitful fields and timberland, what would it profit me if death should call, and I should be compelled to leave it all? If I could somehow win this world's applause, and rise to lofty heights in some great cause, if I could have my fondest hopes fulfilled, and with the prestige won, be greatly thrilled, what would it profit? If I reach my goal, and then should die in sin, and lose my soul. If I could boast myself of noble birth, and consort with the greatest ones of earth. If I could make some friends in every land, and find in every place an outstretched hand. How dreadful in the end would be my lot, if Christ should then declare, I know you not. In Mark 8, 36 and 37, Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In the parable of the ten virgins, in Matthew 25, 10 through 12, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. What would it profit us if we gain all the riches of this world and lose our soul? What would it profit us if we had a host of earthly friends and yet didn't have Jesus as our friend? Won't you surrender your will to him who gave his life for your soul that it might be saved? Trust him, turn from sin, confess him, put him on in baptism, live a faithful Christian life that heaven might be your home. Friends, thanks for watching. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.